Hi, I'm Larry Nespoli with the New Jersey Council of County Colleges. At New Jersey's community colleges, we believe that our students, as well as all citizens, need to be informed about the important issues facing higher education. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by TD Bank, Bergen Community College, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. And by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by Commerce Magazine. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. You see, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. It's our pleasure to welcome for the first time, won't be the last. He just turned 20 years of age. <laughs> he was a star on Broadway yep. from Montclair, New Jersey, Colin Kelly Sordelet. Hey, Steve, thank you so much for uh, You were at Juilliard, but you left Juilliard. Yes, indeed. If I'm wrong, you're going to tell me this. Uh, and you left Juilliard to go perform in The Last Ship, which yep. is uh, Sting's yeah. play. So, uh, yeah, his new musical. His new musical, which... Uh, Closed. Unfortunately, yeah. Okay, Dad, things happen. It's part of life. It happens, yeah. You played uh, young Gideon and also Tom Dawson. Yes. So you admit all these things. Yes, I do. All right. An amazing career at <laughs> 20 years of age. We'll see what happens from here, though. <laughs> I got I to ask you. So when you make the decision, you're at Juilliard, and you make the decision, you say, I'm at Juilliard. You just get there for two minutes. You're there for a hot minute. Yeah. And they come to you. How do you even get this thing thing? How does it even happen? Well, I was really fortunate. I got an agent when I was about 17. I was in high school. Um, some, I, someone took a video of one of the performances I did and put it on YouTube. And then a family friend passed it off to an agent. And they contacted me. And then I ended up signing with them and just went on open calls all the time and uh, had a few appointments. And then I eventually went in for the last ship. And uh, I went and did the workshop, the two-week workshop in the spring of 2013. And so I got to work with uh, Joe Mantello and John Logan and Sting. Don't you get a name dropper? I do my best. Uh, and, and Sting, I, it was really funny because I was, I was still in high school at the time. So I would go and do this workshop during the day and go home and do my high school musical at night. <laughs> and so it was, it was hilarious going and like working with Sting in the mornings and then going to like these like kind of terrible tech rehearsals at yes. night, but, but working with friends, so it was a very humbling experience. Yeah, okay, so while we should yeah. be, we're getting ready to show a clip, but I have to ask you this. When, when you're doing the mm. Sting thing, and you have to describe the first time you met him, but you're doing the Sting thing, you're hanging around Sting, who is just the best, extraordinary, it just, it's, you know, he is Sting. And you're going back, Montclair High? Yeah. Doing your musical. <laughs> at a certain point, when they're dealing with whatever issues that happen in High School Musical, do you say, time out? I was just with Sting today. You got to be kidding me with this. Did you ever remind people who you were working with during the day? I tried not to. <laughs> I tried not to because I think part of it was uh, the whole kind of learning curve of, of how to work in multiple different environments, whether it's a professional or uh, kind of less professional environment, because I think you have to hold yourself to a specific standard no matter what. When did you get so grounded? I don't know, man. And your <laughs> family's connected to the business. Family's connected, so Describe I kind of just learned. Uh, well, my father is a fight choreographer, and he's been he's done some sixty plus credits on Broadway. Um, well, he's, he's done all like the big Disney musicals. He did uh, Beauty and the Beast and Lion King, and uh, he's a fight choreographer. Fight choreographer, so he does, what, what stages all the fights uh, and all those um, biggies. Uh, well, I mean, let's see, what else did he, he's currently working on a show called Big Love at Signature Theater. What fights did he, come on, some big fights. I mean, like the Scar fight, uh, the Scar and uh, Simba fight in That's Lion huge. King. That's huge! Yeah, he did that, he did um, Gaston versus the Beast, and he did, um, they're all like kind of flooding in my mind. Yeah, but also your mom. And my actress. mom, yeah, both my parents went to, they met at a, a Mason Gross at Rutgers uh, in the graduate Great program. Place. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal, I actually almost went there. 
Um, and so they went, they met in the graduate program. But you picked a lesser place, Juilliard. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> that, I mean, they were, they were kind of nice to me. Yeah, right. No, they were, they were so you come kind. from a performance yeah. kind of driven family. Can we take a look at the last ship? Absolutely. Let's take a look at uh, the last ship. You're good in this. Let's take a look. For those who don't know, the premise of The Last Ship is? Uh, it really focuses on the community of Wall's End. It's a shipbuilding community uh, in like the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. Um, and, and it primarily focuses on the story of Gideon, who left for 15 years, getting away, not wanting to be in building ships and working in this dangerous community. You played that role. Uh, that ro role was played by Michael Esper, but I played a young Gideon right. uh, when he's 15 years old, about 15, 16 years old, and is really fighting, um, is really fighting with his father about having to move into the shipyards and, and kind of following the path of his, of his forefathers. And so he decides that he's going to go and leave this town because he has much bigger dreams. And so he uh, runs off and goes on ships and works in, uh, as like a sailor for about 15 years and comes back uh, for his father's funeral. And also to kind of rekindle uh, his old love of Meg. And he learns that he has a son and kind of uh, is dealing with having to become a father and trying to uh, trying to rekindle that relationship, that lost relationship with her, and she's now with someone else. Interesting stuff. While the shipyards are actually closing as well, and so it's all of this trying to. Uh, a lot of it was yeah. things early life. A lot of it was. Uh, a lot of it takes place about. Um, it's not so much autobiographical about Sting's own life, but about the community in which he grew up in sure. and that raised him. Let me ask you this: Describe the first time you met him. First time I met Sting was uh, my first audition uh, for, for the last ship's workshop. And so I walk in, I guess it was, and maybe I guess it was my callback. And so I walk into the room and there's people lined at pianos and all at the desk. And then I see in the back there's Sting with his feet up on a table, just like chilling out. And I'm just like, is that, that's Sting. Like, oh my God. And so it's taking everything for me to not like run over and like rub his head for luck or something or, or start breaking out and singing Roxanne. And it, it, he was phenomenal. And from that moment on, he was always so kind and generous and so professional and such a laid back guy. Like, well, was, he was he laid back in the elevator when you met him? When I met him in the elevator, we had just finished up doing a, uh, a, uh, charity uh, CD. It's, it's for uh, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. It's called um, Carols for a Cure. And so we all did our own song. We did a song um, done by Sting. It's called Soul Cake. And so we just finished up rehearsal and we get in the elevator and I'm inches from Sting. And as a joke, I'm just like, Sting, I've never been so close to you. And he goes, don't stand so close to me. And I'm just like, <laughs> no. Like, did he actually, and everyone in the elevator just goes like, oh. It, it was so funny. Um, He's a he, great guy. He was a great guy. Uh, I miss him. Like that's like honestly, uh, in this past week since the show is closed, I think one of the hardest parts is not being surrounded by the wonderful people I got to work with. Every like day. a family. It was a family. It became a family. What did you do for an encore? You mean after the show? Or, Meaning, or, a if you try to go back to Juilliard, do you have to audition have to re again. Yeah, I have to reapply and re-audition. So can't kinda, you just say I worked with Sting? Just let me back in. I wish it worked that way. It I really did. Way? Unfortunately, it doesn't. That place is tough. It is. Uh, I loved it there, and it, it was a, a wonderful experience. And I really, I would do if I could do it all over again. I would do the same thing. Um, Meaning, you wouldn't pass that up. I, I, couldn't, couldn't. I couldn't. have passed up Juilliard, and I couldn't have passed up the last ship. I mean, they were both these huge uh, things for me. But that was definitely the hardest decision I ever made uh, in terms of leaving Juilliard. It took me a solid two weeks of just weighing my options. Of, am I gonna do it? Do it. Should I stay? Should I leave? And I don't now know. you start all over again. And now I start all over again. And where I'm kind of at right now is if I'm going to audition, I kind of want to just audition professionally and kind of continue to work for a career. Uh, I completely reserve the right to go back to school. I'm just not quite sure when that's <laughs> going to be yet. And you're ready for everything. Rejection, yeah. challenges, Absolutely. ups, downs, all of it. I think part of it is you have to be able to separate yourself from 
the from the audition and from the work that you're doing that you put all your work into it and you work really hard for that audition but when you walk out of that when you walk out of that room you have to let it go and you have to be comfortable with whatever the outcome's going to be because if you you can't take it personally. You can't take this rejection personally because oftentimes you'll walk in the room and you just don't look like what they had in mind. Or it's just it's How sometimes old are you again? Forty? Something, something like that. <laughs> I don't know. I always forget. People keep reminding me. They're like, Colin, you're only like 19. I'm like, Why, what? Why'd you get that? I wait. A did you say you're 20? I'm 20 now. Yeah. So I, you're not 19. See, I forgot. Stop. Too. Okay. <laughs> you just you're getting more mature every day. Listen, Colin, we wish you nothing but the best, Thank and everyone you so much. who happens to be from Montclair and, and others are very proud of you and uh, just keep doing what you're doing and you so keep that very positive attitude. I'll okay? do my best. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Hey, Thank you so much up. for having me. Stay with us. One-on-one. -on -one, we'll be right back right after this. That was great. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome one of my colleagues, uh, one of my favorite colleagues. Patricia Stark is a communications coach and also um, one of the newest anchors over at the Fox News Channel. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Steve. So great to be here with you. Well, um, you've been doing this for a couple of years. <laughs> More than a couple. <laughs> yeah, and we knew each other from another network at another time. Yes. Isn't it funny how the business comes around that it's way? It's true. It's, it's less than six degrees of separation. That's why you always think. have to be nice to people, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> and not just that. because of that. You should be anyway. <laughs> exactly. Um, maybe we'll get to Fox a little bit later, but sure. I want to talk about your work as a communication coach. Yes. Describe that because you help a lot of people. Well, you know, it started kind of organically years ago when I was doing a lot of corporate media and I would be there either moderating or anchoring for them. And some of the people would just be very, very nervous. And I would start to help them work through their messaging, work through their nerves, and then production companies would call me back and they'd say, hey, that worked out really well. Can you come in just to coach our people? And I was like, oh, light bulb moment. Uh, there's a need for this. You created the company. Yeah, exactly. What's it called? It's called Patricia Star Communications. I like that. Yeah. Very catchy. <laughs> uh, Patricia, I'm going to do this because one of the areas, and you know that in my other life, I do a lot of coaching yes. as well and help people um, in the corporate world and nonprofit world. Mm -hmm deal with a lot of communication issues as yes. well. But one of the things I, when I was on your website, I thought, I love this thing where she talks to people about being more confident. Mm -hmm. We're going to put up a graphic, and I want you to talk us through this. Yeah. Um, if we could put up the graphic, and I want Patricia to talk us through this. This is the graphic that talks about building confident communication skills. Talk us through that. Sure. Well, the first thing we're talking about is the inner critic. And one of the greatest gifts I've received from coaching is the knowledge that I don't care who it is, wealthy, famous, rich, sexy, everybody's got the inner critic. And we have to get to a point where we accept that, but we just decide not to take direction from it. And it's not an easy thing to do, but I think that if we once we realize that this is something that's in the back of everybody's mind, especially when you're out of your comfort zone or you're trying something new or you're spreading your wings in a place that you're not familiar with, mm. to just accept it but not take direction from it is the first thing to do. And it, it, uh, we have conversations going on in our head, don't we? Absolutely. And sometimes that conversation isn't so nice. No. Not nice to ourselves. And, and, I, and I call it the IC, the inner critic, and in this book that I'm writing, where it's like a squatter in your head <laughs> that you can't get rid of. Uh, but you can start to treat it like a spoiled child. And you can be kind of like, you know what? Here comes that little boy or girl again, you know, from my past or who's living in the back of my head. But right now, I'm going to tell you, you need to go to sit in the timeout chair. So what do you say? You say, go sit in the timeout chair. And what do you say to yourself? <laughs> you say to yourself, you know what? I've earned the right to be here. To me, there's nothing more that instills confidence than saying, how have I earned this moment? How have I earned the right to be uh, someone who is asked to do this public speech? How have I earned the right mm -hmm. to go on this interview? And you have to go through an inventory and, and put it in writing. You really have to, because think about how we uh, have memories. Everything is very condensed That's right. and very kind of uh, you know, modified. So we look at things in such a glimmer, in such a glance, so that we literally have to go back and say, all right, let me really look through my LinkedIn profile. Let me really look through all of those letters of recommendation that I've gotten Remind over the years. yourself. You have it to. It didn't just happen that you right. got asked to do this. Right. The other thing you have is, it, put the graphic back up, because I like put your personal stamp, is it? Yes. So Talk put your personal that. stamp on all you know. So a perfect example was I was working uh, 
on a show and they were looking for the next Dr. Oz, right? So all of these doctors that they were interviewing, everybody was saying, well, he's not like him and he's not like him. <laughs> and you know what? There is only one Dr. Oz, right? So just imagine if we all only wanted to go to one doctor in the world. We would never get there and whatever disease was killing us, we would die of it, right? So what do we do? We find that expert that's in our hometown or our area or whatever it may be. So when you're looking at yourself as someone who's an authority or supposedly an expert on something, you have to say to yourself, yeah, maybe there is somebody who's uh, bigger and better and maybe could handle this better. But right now, I'm the expert here in this moment for these people mm -hmm. who have asked me to come forward and do that. And you've got to own that. And that, that has to be enough. And we get obsessed and we think, don't I think that person's better than I am? We're dead. Yeah. Absolutely. We get paralyzed right. in comparing ourselves to someone else or thinking I can't be that person. That's right. Then where are you? That's right. Who are you? Yeah. You know, I always tell my clients and students, you know what? God gave everybody an, a fingerprint. No one has the same fingerprint in this entire world. It's mm -hmm. like this incredible DNA thing that says this is only you. And that's what I always say. Put that fingerprint on whatever you do because there's no one else that could ever do that. I like that. Uh, Patricia, could you uh, do something quick for us on body language? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, put it up if you could, Georgette. Okay. So. Uh, I was recently uh, certified as a body language expert. I went to the Body Language Expert, uh, um, the Body Language Institute down in Washington, D.C. a year ago. And it really just kind of helped solidify my training to let people know what message they're sending when they're not saying anything and how to read other people, which is hugely important in communication, nonverbal communication skills. So one of the really cool things that we learned was there was this study done uh, at Harvard uh, by a woman named Amy Cuddy. And she showed that the way that you hold your body actually affects your cortisol levels, which are your stress hormone, and your testosterone levels, male or female, which is your confidence hormone, right? So they showed it within just two minutes, if you kind of went into a fetal position, how do, how do you sit when you're looking at your resume or you're looking at your phone? You're imploding, you're falling into yourself. This actually makes your cortisol levels skyrocket, which are your stress hormones, so and your you testosterone your go oh, down. Sorry for interrupting, Patricia. Yes. You put your shoulders back. By the way, was that the first one, Georgette? Stand tall. You stand tall or sit tall. You, when what, you what stand happens? tall, when you open up, your cortisol levels drop and your testosterone levels actually rise so that you're willing to take more chances, to feel more empowered. So we're st standing and sitting wrong usually before we're going into that job interview or we're, you know, protecting and pacifying and doing all these other things where if we just stood up and uh, there's something called the Superman pose where you just stand what? up and you put your, your, your hands on your Superman your or superwoman. Body, or superwoman, that's right. And it actually changes your physiology. Does it, does it, and, and by the way, you talk about eye contact. Why is that so important? That's one of the items, too. Well, think about it. I mean, is it staring at people? No, it's not the crazy? stalker's stare. Because the people but it's, stare, it's that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's a degree of, of how you should do it, but there's nothing worse than not making eye contact. We have an 11-year-old boy, and when we see his friends and we see other people, kids are not necessarily good at that. And we're constantly like, look at the server if we're in a restaurant. Make eye contact with your teachers and with your mm. parents. It connects people. This is how we connect, through looking at each other eyes and when we don't do that it feels uncomfortable it feels awkward we don't trust people we're like why aren't they looking at me and it makes us feel uncomfortable we mirror each other we sure when we're do. sitting with each other Patricia last thing I want to ask you is this um, I don't care how experienced you are even though I coach people on my end to do this there have been times that I have felt a degree of anxiousness sure, absolutely. maybe you have as well you talk to people about calming their nerves yes Talk about that. Years ago, I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to interview Helen Hayes before she passed away. And I was really young, just starting out, and I said, I get nervous all the time. How do I stop getting nervous? And she was like, honey, if I stop getting nervous, put me in my coffin, because I'm done. And I was like, what are you talking about? She said, that energy is good. We label it wrong. You have to call it excited for the opportunity. How do you it gets, calm down, though? It gets you sharp. OK, so there's three things that I, rec uh, that I recommend to my clients. Chewing gum has been proven. I see it right yep. there, chewing it, it gum. It calms you. It actually helps you focus. That repetitive motion studies have shown it helps college students study better. It relaxes your jaw, gets that coating off of your tongue, gets the juices flowing, right? Another thing is to make sure that you meditate just in a New York Minute. I worked with an author that wrote a book called Meditation in a New York Minute, and right. it showed how 30 seconds of the water cooler, letting that shaky snow globe over your mind just settle before you go into that meeting or whatever, because we're all multitasking. We have so much on our plate. Just take 30 seconds to mellow out. And the last one about and prepare, prepare, prepare. Prepare, prepare, prepare. You know, nothing instills confidence than feeling like, all right, I have a game plan. And rather than listening to those doubtful words, I'm going to switch it to, okay, what's my plan and how am I going to follow my plan? i got to tell you mine real quick one before my last question. 
sometimes I carry this baseball that uh, my kids played with in the little in a t-ball championship. I carry it around with me sometimes, and I throw it. And yeah, isn't it weird? No, because it's your anchor. It's it something is. that you know you're it, it's you're rubbing it. It's it's a consistent thing, probably like people do with like stones that it's have true. nice sayings on them. Whatever it is, it's a ritual. Is it an important thing? Last question. Yes. Um, I know you're talking about communication, but I connect leadership and communication very directly. Yes, so absolutely. Asking everyone who I think knows about leadership this question: the most important leadership lesson you have learned in your work is is a listening to other people. The best communicators are the best listeners, I think. And you can't just assume that you have all the answers. I think you have to always ask for feedback. You want to always connect with people on a human level. And I think that that's, that's the biggest thing. Be human and let other people be human and connect. Patricia Stark, who is not just a great communication coach, but you can also catch her on the Fox News Channel when? Thursdays and Fridays, overnights, uh, 8 p.m. till 6 a.m., depending on what's going on in the night. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank, Thank you, Thank you so much. Thanks Great for having stuff. me. Made my job very easy. Stay <laughs> with us. We'll be right back right after this. That was good stuff. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're pleased to be joined by Dr. Ohan Karadapak, who is the Wellness Director at Holy Name Medical Center. Good to see you, Doctor. Good to be here. You're taking care of your people uh, at Holy Name. They're a lot healthier now, right? They are healthier. They are. How that happened? Pregnant. Well, a couple of years ago, we started a wellness program at Holy Name Hospital. And um, we decided to uh, screen our employees with certain uh, parameters, like body um, uh, measurements of the um, blood pressure and uh, waist circumference and body mass index, and then we did some blood tests uh, to see if they have any um, problem that they can develop chronic diseases, so we can prevent them before they do that. So we do wellness. We we did get measurements, body mass index, waist circumference, and then blood pressure, and then the other measurements are uh, lipid profile, which is cholesterol profile, and then we do hemoglobin A1C, which is indication for if you, have, if you are pre-diabetic or di you have diabetes, and we do vitamin D level. All these things, five items actually, besides vitamin D, gives us something called metabolic syndrome. If you have three out of those fives, you have mm. high risk of developing chronic diseases, like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure. And you've identified a lot of things. Right, we can, we can identify, we can see really how many of them have this metabolic syndrome, and we guide them to see their physicians, we guide them to, to treat them properly. Besides that, we do obviously uh, smoking cessation, we do exercise, all that together. What has been the reaction of the employees? Uh, actually terrific. Um, and we did initiate a weight loss program for them because we have obesity issue too. As you know, in the nation, we have in the hospital the same ratio, one third of the uh, employees are obese and the same in the nation. What one kind third, of success have you had? Uh, terrific actually. And because we don't have this obesity treatment, is not a one type of treatment. It's not, it is uh, personalized. So we have, we categorize people. We, we, we see the body, um, body style and body uh, profile. And after that, we put them on one of the eight different programs. Like somebody, somebody could be a normal weight obese person. I'm talking about normal weight obese because obesity is not a weight issue. Right. Obesity is an over excess body fat issue. And somebody can be under either. We call under either because they eat less than 1,800 calories. They shut down their metabolism. Actually, we created so many people in the United States with, I call them low calorie dieter syndrome. It is with the low calorie, they shut down their metabolism, they lose weight, and they gain back again more, and now they have lower metabolism, they're actually in dead end street. So we categorize obese people first, we put them in profile, and then we have one of the eight programs that fits for them, and we do that. Let's say if somebody is really not eating properly and is under either, we feed them more. Somebody is over either, we cut their feeding. Uh, but it's very personalized. Them. Personalized, completely. And the exercise is the same way. If you overexercise, actually, you can harm the body, you screw the cortisol, and then we cut their exercise. If they are under exerciser, we make them properly exercise, and we give them certain supplements, depends what they are. Doctor, this wellness movement is huge. Why it, is that? It is because, uh, first, we have to start from our you know, own home to, uh, to get really people healthier, as we, we, we have had our health organization in the hospital. Uh, but we see that um, the health trend is really 
because of the obesity, because of all those chronic diseases that's coming up in the United States more and more, and obviously people are getting more and more, we are seeing more chronic diseases. And then our, our life expectancy is not increasing anymore. It's plateaued. As, in, we are, as you know, we're number 17 in the world now as a nation. We're not anymore first or second or third because of the obesity taking off, really. That's, that's, that has to be controlled somehow. But it's so, uh, so difficult to explain to people that by under-eating, which all the programs, most majority of the programs out there, cut the calorie down for right. people, and they lose weight and they shut down their metabolism. So sometimes they have to eat more but eat certain kinds of food. Exactly. Eat more and proper food, though. Because let's say if you're eating 2,000 calories and you're gaining, they put them on 1,200 calories. Huh. Instead of saying, okay, let me adjust your food and let me adjust your exercise, increase your metabolism. As soon as you put them on 1,200 calories, there's 800 calorie difference. They lose some weight, but comes from water, fat, and muscle. And now their metabolism is shut down. So you have to bring them up again. As a matter of fact, what we did was that, oh, in our hospital, when first 100 people, they enroll for weight loss, we, we tell them, bring us your diary. One week of diary to see what it is. So what we saw was that 70% of our 100 people, they were eating less than 1,800 calories. And they're wow. obese, and they are here for me to help them to lose weight. So immediately what we did was that in, increase their calorie up and depends on their exercise profile, adjust their exercise and they start to lose weight. Actually they were complaining, we are eating, I'm eating too much, what am I going to do? But meanwhile losing weight and suddenly they realize, oh my god, this is how it works. Doctor, I'm going to ask you this, uh, time we have left, how rewarding is this for you? Well, it's terrific obviously. I have, uh, I, I have started this long time ago. At Whole Name Hospital, actually 25 years ago, we had a weight control center at that time. But it was a low calorie like now old people do. Now I realize at that time that, oh, this is not the way to do the obesity is a totally different disease. It is not weight, it is excess body fat. Like you can be normal weight and obese. Yes. Yes, because we, we do measurements. Waist circumference is the key, actually. It's not the body mass index. If you take the body mass index of somebody, let's say if it's overweight, you don't know if that person is obese or normal unless you measure the waist circumference. You gotta do the waist circumference. Waist circumference. Let's say if you are a bodybuilder. A few, few seconds left, go ahead. Yeah, and the body mass index is really high, 35 or so, and then if you measure the waist circumference, it's normal. This person is overweight with over muscle, nothing to do. On the other hand, if you're body missing this normal person, you get mm -hmm. in the picture, and then suddenly you measure the waist circumference, it is big, that person is obese. So you have to treat that obesity. Doctor, you've taught us a lot in a very short period of time. I want to thank you. And we invite you back to uh, continue to talk to us about wellness, not just at Holy Name, but for all the, the rest of us who are trying to deal with this issue. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by TD Bank, Bergen Community College, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, New Jersey Natural Gas, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.